a bit more A and P stuff. So the musculoskeletal system is made up of bones, muscle, cartilage, tendons, ligaments. All right. We'll talk about all these briefly here real quick. You'll see questions on this. All right. Here's a skeleton. Take A and P and learn this because, again, this helps you. Your job's going to be a lot easier when you understand this. Even if you only take the intro to A and P class they have here. It's a good class. Um, it's one semester. With that said, it's not a transferable credit. So if you plan on going beyond this, you probably want to take A&P 1 and A&P 2, okay? If you don't care and you don't, you're not going beyond this and you want to know a little bit more, right here, okay? Um, you're not required to know all of this stuff. But skull, these are clavicles right here, okay? So the clavicles come across. Let me do this first. You got your skull. You got the spine, right? And these are all ribs. So the spine hooks into the pelvic bone that is kind of your anchor and pivot. And your legs go into that. Your arms are held on with the clavicle in the front. Your arms are literally an attachment, a machine attachment. They put it on. They put a clavicle on here and attach it. And then the back is hooked up with the shoulder <coughs> blade scalpula, okay? Oh. You're going to know these, all right? Everybody say pelvis. If we hear the word ilium or the iliac crest, it's the tip. Your pelvis is more like a bowl. Your iliac crest, if you want to feel one, no, you can't touch me, but it's right here, okay? Um, femur, this is called a femur head or the acetabular head is the acetabular is the where the ball and socket go together. Okay, common place of fracture called acetabular fracture, or the ball of the femur busts off. This is a bad fracture, super bad. Okay, bad fracture. We'll talk about it in a little while. These actually hold blood inside of them. Enough blood loss that if you broke this, this, and this, and you're an old person, you may die from it just from blood loss, okay? So, you guys have covered ribs already a little bit, right? Hits a lot of thoracic stuff, damages a lot of stuff in the abdomen. This is all superficial stuff, but the humerus holds a lot of blood, half of a liter to 750 milliliters of blood can be stored in your humerus, okay? You won't be tested on this. Um, you will be on these. We'll cover them in a second. But be familiar, C-spine, how many are there? Uh, seven. seven. Thoracic, Twelve. how many sets of ribs are there? Twelve. See a, see a pattern there? How about lower lumbar? Five. Sacral? Five. Okay, right on. Um, we don't count this crap. You can break that and it hurts. Uh, but otherwise it's relatively insignificant. We're not gonna do anything about it, neither is a doc. It's not, it doesn't do anything. It's not gonna hurt anything. Um, know the main, you don't need to be able to come in and do feet and rip the feet apart and go, oh, that's the metatarsal, because I don't know that, all right? I don't plan on knowing that. If you do know it, great, you're better for it. Know the main bones, radius, ulna, humerus, skull, clavicles, scalpula, you're going to need to know the vertebrae for sure. Okay? C1 through 7, T1 through 12, L1 through 5, a sacrum 1 through 5. Got to know them. Uh, as far as all the little phalanges and the digits and metacarpals and all that, don't need to know that stuff. It helps. Don't sweat it for this class. Okay? Any questions? So, Skeleton supports against gravity. It lets you have movement, protection, and here produces blood cells. All right? That happens inside of here. Stores calcium and phosphorus. Any questions? Yeah. 
There you go. Bones of the skull. Frontal, temporal, parietal, occiput. Um, don't worry about hammering her way on these, all right? You don't need to be experts on this yet. It doesn't hurt to know the cranial bones, but this is the mandible. Um, that can actually break and displace and occlude the airway, where you can't get anything in there to take care of airway. Okay. Uh, so what would you do? Just suction? Call for help. Besides that? Suction. Suction, suction, suction and try and bag the best you can and hope that it you're going to feel resistance when you're bagging that person. But you'll, they'll take what they can take in through their nasal passages. Yeah, because you can't, you've got to, it's totally crushed. Yeah, if it's broke, if it broke, it breaks and comes up and it can bypass and be over the plate or under, but it'll lock in and you can't move it at all. I mean, I can't fix that. I can do something about it. But I'll go right here. Got a hole in their neck, but. You have to go up here in Mexico to do that. Okay, on the face, so mandible. Don't write too much. All right? Be familiar with it. Start understanding temporals, your orbits, parietals. This is the frontal plate. That suture between the plates is called the coronal suture. Um, don't sweat these. You got enough material to memorize, all right? To learn, not memorize. Don't. You'll learn this as you go. All right. You need to be familiar with this. We already talked about it. C7, T12, L5, S5. Yay. Coxic 4. Those don't really count, by the way. That's basically this. What's happening? Um... C1 is called Atlas, right? Y'all seen that? Big Atlas dude, got the weight of the world. The weight of the world is your big fat head, all right? It pivots on C1, that's why it's called Atlas. Um, <clears throat> C2 is the axis. Be familiar with the spinal column, okay? You really need to be able to spit this out. Thorax, again, you probably covered a little of this A&P when you did thoracic trauma. Twelve sets of ribs. Uh, who knows what the most common fractured ribs are? Nine, twelve, twelve. Five. Five, five, five. Four through five through eight, four through eight. Depends on the text. Roughly four through eight. Okay. You got one. This is kind of a crude drawing. One is almost, is protected underneath your clavicle. The large portion of two is as well. It comes in somewhere right here before it clears your clavicle. Okay? Um, if you break one, two, or three, if you find something wrong with somebody that has one, two, or three broken and you can actually diagnose fracture or rib one, two, or three, they got problems. The force to destroy those bones is huge. And if they have that, did y'all cover, cover what was called an aortic dissection? If they have one of these broke, they probably have an aortic dissection. It's a money shot. The force to get through that and actually fracture it is huge. Okay. The ones below that, five, six, seven, and eight, not so much. I can walk up to you right now and give me an open shot and uh, I'm a Chuck Norris dude. No, I'm not online. Uh, that's right. <laughs> um, so in between it's called the intercostal spaces. Um, just no sidebar, don't need to know, no. The ribs are in a circle, they have a... When your rib... People think your rib is around bone. It's actually on the back side and underneath. It has a little pocket in it. Nerves, blood vessels travel through there. Okay. Uh, 
That's all cartilage that connects it. It's called the costal arch. Or in here they call it that costal angle. But the costal arch can be fractured very easily. Guys play a game. It's crazier and stuff, but where they tense up and do this stuff and let their buddy come up and hit them as hard as they can, see how much they can take. They take turns like a fight club thing or something. I don't get it. Please don't hit me. It hurts. Those people can get those injuries fractured. It's like, uh, I mean, it's cartilage. It snaps off real easy and it hurts, but we can't do anything about it and the doc's probably not going to do anything about it. Uh, floating or what? Floating ribs? 12, 11, sometimes 10. Those are the ones that come in and stab the kidneys because they are not connected to cartilage. Okay, it stops down there. So it's open and it can stab away. So 12 pair of ribs, you got your sternum. It protects the heart and the lungs, cage. Hmm. Pelvis. It's a bony ring. It's actually... <coughs> Two bones, three fused, made of the ilium, the ischium, and the pubis. Okay, the ilium. This is the pubis area. Um, this bad boy can hold up to two liters of blood in it. The okay. pubis has the most uh, blood. Absolutely. In the pelvis. The pelvis period can store one to one and a half to two liters of blood in it. Yeah, it depends on the text, really. Oh. And it's, uh, uh, they say it causes fracture, especially in the elder. Yeah. Is, you know, that's serious, and they, I think one of my guys told me once it's the beginning of the end. That is exactly what I was going to tell you. The elderly person has a fall bad enough to fracture the pelvis, it is the beginning of the end. Okay? I know it sounds funny, but. My neighbor right behind me in the woods, older fella, he is 86, 87, um, two, year and a half ago, fell in his front yard. He was doing yard work and fell in and hit it right on the edge of his sidewalk in his front yard. Um, fractured his rib or his pelvis. It was pretty obvious. It's very painful. He got him hooked up, took him away. His son-in-law is a friend of mine. We talked. I said, look, man, you all got to stay on him. He's going to have health problems. Uh, he did. He died the day after Christmas. It just, it's hard for older people to recover from it. I don't know why, but it kills them. Okay. It's almost like a textbook. It's going to, if you break your pelvis and you're this old, you're going to die. How old is she? Good. See? Exception to the rule. It's not textbook. But in a lot of people, it is most people, my experiences have been that it's very traumatic and in a couple of years they're gone. So grandma's bad. Okay. Uh, I don't know why it is, but it really is a terrible injury for elderly people. Okay, lower extremities, femur. <coughs> the femur is the largest bone in the body. The femur is the largest bone in the body. The femur, got it? Kneecap, tibs out front, fibulas in the back, then you got tarsals, metatarsals, phalanges, right about this. Um, these break, you see these open fractures. Uh, I've probably seen, I don't know, 30 open tib fib fractures in the last 10 years. They're pretty benign. They hurt, they suck. They suck for the people that broke them, but they really don't, uh, they're very recoverable from, okay? It's still traumatic and you could lose a lot of blood, but typically they don't bleed too much. Not, not, too, not too traumatic really, okay? Now you'll see open tib fibs right here on motorcycle accidents. Who rides a motorcycle? Yes. You laid one down yet? Broke your tib on it? Yeah. Uh, lower leg fractures on motorcycles. 
guys that lay them down. Most of these guys see the other clown. They lay their stuff down and they suffer right here. I've seen a large amount of right here. I don't know why, just the way it grabs their foot, but it pulls it out to the side and their foot looks like it's, their leg will be straight down and their foot will be sticking out to the side like this. And you see the ball of their tib fib. It either breaks through the skin or it's just sitting there and you can see it on the skin. It's pretty gross looking. They call it twisted fracture? Uh, no, they're actually called, <laughs> when it gets like that, they're actually not always fractured. They're dislocated. I think they're all fractured because you don't turn your foot 90 degrees <laughs> and have a bone sticking through the skin like that. It's bad. So but what's up, you put back in place? Nope. I check and make sure they have pulses down there. Good question. You get something like that, you look, do they have pulses? Do they feel you? If they say yes, you very carefully wrap it in a pillow. Somebody's job is to baby their lower leg and you little want a stretcher. If there's a medic on scene, they can give them happy pills. Give happy pills. Yeah, and then take them to the hospital. That's really all you're going to do for that. Call a pillow splint. Uh, yeah, if you get something like that and you got time to get paramedic on scene that can give drugs, give drugs. I said it earlier, our biggest job, pain management. Uh, all right, upper extremities, we already talked about the shoulder girdle, clavicle in the front, scalpel in the back. You got the humerus, the radius, okay, thumb side, everybody, and the on right, radio pulses. On this side, so don't be looking over here. Um, you'll see if these that fracture, usually fracture lower. Pretty often they both fracture, not always. Um, mostly in kiddos, falls. Uh, you don't need to know carpals, metacarpals, all that stuff. These are the big bones you need to know. Radius, ulna, humor, scapula, clavicle, C-spine, femur, tib, fib. Skull. Okay. Any questions? Some muscles. Um, so their job is to help you maintain posture, you know, keep your bones standing up. Because if you took the muscles away, the bones would fall down. If you put a pile of muscles up, took the bones away, the muscles would fall down. They allow for movement. You have three types of muscle. You have three types of muscle. You have three types of muscle. Skeletal. It's called striated. These are actually individual little cell fibers all through there that work together. They pull on each other. Their kind? Smooth muscle. Smooth muscle is all in voluntary muscle. That means it's a muscle that moves and you probably don't know anything about it. You don't feel it. Who's got an idea of smooth muscle? You guys are cheaters. Respiratory system, lungs, uh, blood vessels, they dilate, they constrict. Uh, that's all smooth muscle. And then cardiac muscle is in itself unique, right? So if you tear this, it'll fix itself and grow back, right? You can tear parenchyma in your lungs, the alveoli. It can repair itself. You damage this muscle, not fixing that. So that's why when people have heart attacks, the, the muscle's unique in the fact that it does its contractions and that it has an electrical conduction system. The, actually, the electrical conduction system in the heart is in its own, its own muscle type of cardiac muscle. Okay. To be that dynamic, the punishment is, is that it can fix itself. So when you lose oxygen to this part and you have a heart attack and it's without oxygen for too long, the muscle dies and now your heart is less effective. And it always will be. You never regrow it back. And so you got skeletal is for movement and posture. It's striated. It's voluntary muscle typically. Right, walking, running, all that stuff. Me up here yapping. Smooth muscle, 
lungs, bronchioles, trachea. That's too technical for me. Uh, You're going above and beyond the <laughs> curriculum. It's dead. Oh. Yep. So smooth muscles, all involuntary. GI system, right? You ate a hamburger, belly's working it over right now, pushing it down into the intestines. Uh, and then the cardiac muscle. <coughs> See all that in yellow? You should know that. Skeletal voluntary attaches to bones by attaches to bones by attaches. Okay. I had an instructor who said everything six times. He's a medical director in Palestine. Uh, he says everything six times. That's a hint. It's a past question. Okay. Um, shortening up. Oh, mother of God. You've got to be kidding me. <laughs> That's so smart. Okay. Any questions here? Any questions here? Smooth muscles. I already talked about it. Carries out involuntary movements located in the walls of the GI tract, the GU tract, the respiratory, the blood vessel. What is that? What is that? What is that? Urinary. Urinary. Okay. Cardiac muscle has automaticity. It does its own thing. It can initiate its own contractions without any kind of external stimulation. It just does it and it wants to do it. Questions on cardiac muscle? You guys will actually hammer pretty good on cardiac. Have you already done that? Angina, MIs, all that kind of stuff? Okay. Okay. Tendons and ligaments. Ligament connect bone to bone. Tendons connect muscle to bone. I'm going to say that three times. I'm not, but pretend I did. Ligament bone to bone, tendon muscle to bone. That's exactly how I meant, remembered it. And really? Yep. Lick a bone. Come up with stupid little analogies to remember <laughs> stuff to get you through a test. Mm -hmm. um, they either can be injured and have similar presentations to an injured muscle. Um, you need to know this, be familiar with it, know how this thing works. In treating this, are you going to know if it's a tendon or ligament? But you're going to treat it the same. Okay. Period. You're going to treat it the same. We'll talk about head injuries here in, in another hour or so. You're going to learn a lot about head injuries and then you're going to learn we, for the vast majority of them, we treat them the same. <coughs> Cartilage covers the bone ends and makes it so there's not erosion and roughing it up and all that good stuff. It's like a <coughs> graphite sheet in there protects in its structure, the nose, ear, the costal cartilage, sternal plates. Okay, joints. Be familiar <coughs> with this. Okay. This is joining point, point, joints. Joining the points of the bone, bone ends cover the cartilage, blah, blah, blah. Ligaments connect bone to bone. Okay. So, we'll talk about joints come into a big deal. You wonder why are we talking about joints? Big deal. Um, 
Joints, we get into joints and you will when you do uh, bandaging and splinting. Joints are huge in stabilizing, okay? So if I blew my knee out or did whatever I did to my knee, it's the joint, right? Ligament or a tendon issue. How are you gonna stabilize that? Above the joint and below the joint, right? If I break this arm right here and it's all flippy flappy, how are you going to immobilize that at the joint above and the joint below? Or this is above and below. Don't worry about that. Technical. <coughs> You'll cover that real big when you get into bandaging and splinting. Um, when you guys go into all the different bandaging and splinting stuff, pay attention to Thomas because it's, it's a long class and it's probably as overbearing as this class, but you'll be tested off on them, a lot of them. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, da, da, da. So is the inner surface the joint cap will line with synovial membrane that's, it's lube, WD-40. <coughs> Extremity trauma. Any questions up to now? No? Talk about fractures. Exactly what it is. <coughs> Excuse me. Dang. Okay, so fractures, a break in the bone's continuity. Fracture causes direct force, indirect force. What's the indirect force? What indirect force can cause a fracture? Uh, okay, yeah. What's another one? I'm looking for one specifically. Off the wall. What'd you say? Uh, yeah, well, that's kind of direct, but... Um, falling down, falling down, indirect. How about walking up and grabbing on to a 7,200-watt transmission line? You know what I'm talking about? Big power line hits the ground, laying in the street, somebody goes up to grab it and move it out of the way. Pretty dumb. Pretty dumb. Indirect force. It'll shred your bones like nothing. What? That wouldn't be indirect. Well, kind of it is. In this terminology, it is. Okay. Twisting your ankle. Twisting forces or torsion diseases of the bone, specifically tumors and osteoporosis. Open versus closed fracture. Okay, you hear compound fractures a lot. That's an open fracture. They say compound is because it's fractured and the skin is open, so it's a compound fracture. We call them open or closed. So closed is the bone is broke and the skin over the fracture is intact. And open is that there's a break in the skin. So you don't have to break your arm and then shove a foot of it out through your arm to be sticking out there to show everybody. Okay, that's not necessary. That can happen. But that's not the definition of an open fracture. It just has to be enough to rip it and rip the skin open. That's it. That's an open fracture. Uh, the bone ends do not have to be exposed. A small opening in the skin communicating with the fracture site equals an open fracture. Um, they're more serious due to external blood loss and possible infle inflection. Infection. There you go. Example that's open. It looks like it hurts. Okay. These are closed, open, breaking the skin. One of the most important things we do in EMS is prevent closed fracture from becoming open. Right? Uh, this also plays into the whole pain thing. Don't pick somebody's leg up and their tip fib snapped in half and it's just flailing all over the place because it hurts. It's a jagged bone on the inside of the tissue poking around. It damages nerves. It can damage uh, uh, the blood vessels in there. You get a femur fracture and not stabilized, it can go in and hit your femoral artery or femoral vein and cause you to bleed to death in short order. Okay. Types of fractures might be something to study at. 
Maybe go home tonight and look at this. Maybe the day before you test, you could look at it too. Okay, transverse fracture. It's basically a 90 degree. Oblique. Is it at an angle other than a 90 degree spiral? It fracture coils through the shaft of the bone like a spring. Um, this is the kind of fracture we hunt on kiddos as far as uh, child abuse. It comes from somebody roughing them up, grabbing a limb and doing this, twisting. Okay, That's, We hunt that stuff. <clears throat> uh, angulated. See, it's got a little obvious displaced and angulated and displaced. These happen a lot with the big, bigger bones, humerus, uh, in your uh, femur, big time. Because not only is this the biggest bone, this is the biggest package of muscle on most people. Okay, it wants to shorten, it wants to pull together. So your femur snaps. Any kind of movement or flexion of that muscle, just guarding from pain, trying to get away from it, that muscle pulls together. Those bone ends look like this or that, and they can run it up beside each other, and they're tearing up skin, nerves, and blood vessels all the way up. Okay. Very the painful. Between oblique and angulated. Oblique is actually the fracture. Okay. It's the line in the fracture. You got transverse is 90. The difference right here is these two. 90 degrees oblique is any fracture, the actual bone break, other than 90 degrees. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a complete, it doesn't have to be a complete fracture all the way through. You know what I mean? You could flex and do this and break and still be, uh, have continuity all the way through on the other side. So then you take take it and make it where maybe it is broke all the way through and it's angulated now. See, it's got a little flex to it. It's hard to see, but... Uh, that would be... Uh, yeah. An oblique could be a hairline fracture, but it could be a through and through fracture as well. It's just maintaining its position. Make sense? This has some kind of pressure or force on it. Just, it's just a bad picture. It's angulated because you can see and there's a different angle from here to here. See it? It should be a little bit more extreme to make it obvious, but it's not. Displaced is basically the same thing except it's displaced. They used so a casting. So displaced is more or less going to move over and then just kind of slide. Right. They're going to kind of go yeah. side by side. Yeah, they used a Captain Obvious description on this one versus that one compared to that because those look exactly the same as a rule in this picture. Uh, angulated and displaced. I mean, know this. Crepitus is uh, public engineering motion. Displaced an angle? Uh, you could probably hear that in any of those. You probably not so much in displaced. It's yes and no. It's basically bone ends rubbing together. And you hear crepitus more in the thorax and in the pelvis. You can feel it more than you can hear it. You push down when you're doing a test. You all practice doing trauma, push this way in for pressure and then push down to test for open book. You can actually, hey, then they're going to let you know when you do it. Yeah. Okay. They're really going to let you know. It's not going to be a secret to anybody in like six square miles. Okay. Impacted, that's a goofy word, common muted, I can never say it. It comes from impact. Bone ends are driven together, so maybe you jumped off a two-story roof. Okay, house is on fire, and you jumped out the second-story window, and you landed on your feet. You could get something like that. It's hard to see in this film, but that's what it really looks like. That looks like a that is a hand. Okay, so it's a common nuded is a broken bone three or more pieces, usually from compression. Green stick, here's a big one, you know that word too. 
shaft of the bone is not completely broken. It's compressed on one side and splintered on the other side. Splintered on the outward, outward on the other side. What group of patient does this type of fracture occur in? Kids. What group of patient does, you know, get it? Oh. Kids. 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 Green stick. Kids. Green stick. Kids. Green stick. Kids. Questions? Here you go. That was the opening. The opening film showed this. Collie's fracture. Okay. It's a fracture of the distal radius. Where's the distal radius? Right. Furthest away. Distal away. Uh, it says it has a fork-shaped pattern. I don't know. I guess that looks like a dinner fork. Some sicko making up narratives for these pictures. But, uh, good for a fall, like especially from height, and they fall onto their hands. Okay. Fracture signs to you and me on the street, running up uh, obvious deformities. Okay. Tenderness. Um, it says it's usually point tenderness and it overlies a fracture site. Yeah, unless it's a femur. I can touch the toe on the leg that the femur's busted on and you're going to know their femur's broke. Because they're going to tell that six mile radius thing, I'm going to know about it. It is so painful. I've never had it, but I've worked a lot of patients that have had it. Drugs. Get drugs. If you don't have an ALS unit, you need to go find the local weed man. <laughs> okay? No, I'm lying. We can't say that out loud in here. They need, they need pain relief. You guys are going to learn a technique that is not pharmacological. Drugs. It's called a traction splint. It's awesome. And it works. Uh, and you guys are going to learn how to put it on. It is underused piece of equipment. I think I've used it maybe three times in ten years. It was pretty awesome. You, know, you literally put it on. It's a mechanical device and it straps on right here. It straps on at their ankle and you start pulling. It looks like a little a winch if you will or a little come along. You just keep pulling on this belt and it basically pulls their leg away. It pulls the bone ends away. And they'll say, oh yeah, right there. And you know you've pulled enough. And you lock it in place. That's all you do. We held traction on a guy, a little girl. She wasn't little. She's like 17. Had a, f a femur fracture from a car wreck. He had an emergency room for like three hours. Me and two other guys took turns holding her leg. It, was pr it sucked. Orthopedics, we'll be right down with the stuff to fix it. Three hours. I saw that. I was a kid. That was traumatizing to me. <laughs> okay. So for you and me on the, on the street, fracture signs are obvious deformities, tenderness. And some deformities are going to be blatantly obvious. I worked a car wreck, Engine 2's district, which is the east side in Temple. Nothing really significant about the car wreck. We were working, doing our stupid stuff that we do, because at the time I was like, this is a bullcrap call. Lady's crying because she got in a car wreck. She's holding her baby like this. And the baby's okay because it's with mom. And I'm walking around. I take care of the vehicles in park. Ignition off. No fuel leaks. And I turn around and start walking her. And, and my buddy, who's a paramedic on engine two, is taking care of this lady, talking to her. He hasn't seen her arm yet. But I'm at the angle where I see the obvious deformity. Her hand kind of looked like that fork. It was I was like, I went, oh! I said, Dad, don't look so good. And she was looking at it, she went, Rah! and started screaming. And she starts screaming, and the baby's like, Rah! and it got, it went south really bad. So don't be stupid like me and say stuff like that, okay? He had her calm, and that's how you want to keep them. I said, oh, what? Don't look so good. And it was on, okay? So they're sometimes obvious. Sometimes they're not. You've got to feel them up. You're really going to feel these patients up, okay, short of violating people. 
right. Uh, so tenderness, uh, inability to use the limb. It's a reliable sign of significant injury if it's present. The reverse is not necessarily true, though. Just because they can use the limb doesn't mean it's not fractured. Okay. Other signs, swelling or ecchymosis. What's ecchymosis? Bruise. All right. See, I can sleep easy tonight because I know I taught you one thing. Exposed fragments, uh, crepitus, it's a grating of the bone ends. Okay, maybe heard or felt. Uh, my experience is that it's felt. Okay, it's not going to jump out at you. You have to actively search for it. Okay, I'm sure they told you the other day when you do find it, you actively search for crepitus, and when you find it, you stop. You don't try to recreate it to prove your theory. It's not trial tests where you have to do it six times. Okay. Uh, and you most certainly don't call your Johnny. Come check this shit out <laughs> and mash around on because that's that's bad. Okay. Dislocations. Woo! That sucks. It's a displacement of the bone from the normal position at the joint. That's bad. That hurts. Um, and once this person has an anterior shoulder displacement, it'll keep popping out. It recurs all the time. And some of them can make it happen. We had a guy in my district, in one's district, that when he had his initial insult, and then he knew it would happen, he'd be picked up every now and then. Then he moved to our area, and it inadvertently happened sometime. He had the displacement. And we took him to the ER. We did the whole splint and pain, drugs, medicine. He went in there and got treated, and they fixed him up. Well, we went back like a couple of days later. Same thing. No, he had a crush on the nurse that took care of him. Oh. <laughs> so he started displacing his shoulder so we could take him to the ER. Yeah. Same nurse? I was, I was like, dude, you got, I got some, you got some issues. No. <laughs> All right, dislocation signs. Uh, deformity, swelling, ecchymosis about the joint, pain, tenderness. Loss of motion is usually perceived as a locked joint. What do these signs and symptoms look like? What's that? They look exactly like a fracture, don't they? The only point of the difference that you're going to really be able to find is that it's right here at a joint. That'll be the biggest difference. That doesn't mean it's not the end of the bone. See, there's a difference, but we're probably going to treat this the same. Because the signs and symptoms are the same. All right. Have you ever missed my fracture on uh, dislocations? Yeah, I'm sure I have. I mean. You went to. Yeah, you went like five slides ahead. Oh, dang. Thanks. Ugh. I'm sure I have. I mean. We take care of the pain, you know what I mean? You stabilize them, but if they have multiple things going on, it's usually something else really bad's already happening, so my focus isn't necessarily on a joint dislocation. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Not saying it hadn't happened, I can't recall a story for you, but I mean, I pulled out people with, I pulled a girl out of a truck a month ago that had broken ribs, her pelvis was broke, this femur was broke twice. The head, acetabular head was broke, this was broke. Um, I think her nose was broke. What's that? Oh uh, no, she was actually stuck in a vehicle that was on fire and she was burning. It sucked. It burnt her head. She had fourth degree burns from about mid calf down. Fourth degree burn is basically everything is gone except the bone. There's no shoes, no socks. We pulled her out of the vehicle and she had leg with third degree burns and then nothing but it looked like dragon skeleton out from her knees down. She was pretty foobard. Uh, charred. She <clears throat> charred. This black bone. It hurt. She was awake the whole time. Uh, she was awake the whole time. Uh, I sat in a car with her for probably 40 minutes. I was inside the vehicle before we got her out. It was a really long extrication. It was a bad wreck. 
she got droves. Much as I could afford to give her without killing her. Uh, Did you take any? <laughs> I was running out, man. You, I needed some, I promise you. I was in bad shape. It's pretty bad to be. You spend that much time in a vehicle with one person, one on one, and know what's happening. I mean, when I crawled into the vehicle through the back window, she rear ended a tractor trailer. She's still telling me she's burning. I'm like, it's okay. We got the fire under control. I'm going to give you some drugs. We're going to take care of this. We're going to get you out of here. This is as a fire. <clears throat> yeah. And I crawl in, and she's like, no, I'm burning. And the vehicle's messed up. And I'm looking down a hole right here because the dash is here and wrapped around her arm is laying on top of the dash. And it's still on fire down in the wheel well. I can look down in the holes and see the car still on fire inside. I was like, shh. It's so. Uh, <clears throat> but I operate in that capacity, I work as a medic. I pulled the line in in that situation. I wouldn't normally, that's not something you we practice. You don't get in the car on fire. But put the line out. The guys are outside extinguishing. We had two lines on it. Guys working on the tractor trailer to slow the fire down. But your job there is paramedic stuff. Get in IV, do the initial trauma assessment, just like you guys are learning. Press sounds, get oxygen on, or all that kind of stuff. Does Fort Decree uh, require amputation? Probably so. And she Most got, she was amputated so. that same, that was about 11.30 at night, and she was amputated by the next night at that time. She lost both legs. Uh, yeah, t fourth degree burns are pretty, pretty terrible. And she's a young girl. She's, I think she was in her late 20s. So. Okay, so I, dang it. I deviated again. Dislocations, same thing. Deformity, swelling, ecchymosis, pain, tenderness, loss of motion. Could be a locked joint, but it looks like fractured sign symptoms, right? So, dislocation or fracture? Um, I'm not overly good at this, but there's a pretty good rule about the rotation if it's out and shortened that it's a fracture. And if it's rotated in, then it's dislocated. But I'm not for sure about that. Don't write that down. Don't write that down. Because I can't remember which way it goes. Um, I know that if I see one shortened and rotated, it's bad. That's how I treat it. Okay. Um, the reason for that is because that's still a natural movement, that being out. Your foot. Yeah. You can have your foot out, but it's not natural for you to have your foot in. Do you know which way it is, though? Fractured or dislocated? Because that's what I can't remember. No. I can't. Like, like you said, you're going to do the same thing anyways. Yeah, you are so, going to do the I mean, same thing. So you're going to you check PMS and stuff. Here. It's not really your Absolutely. What happened. Then. You do your full thing, you're going to check pulse motor sensation in this foot. Because if they don't have a pulse, you will try to fix that. You're allowed to try and fix it one time. Okay, uh, and you'll cover that when you do skill stuff. Sprains, partial temporary dislocations, uh, tearing of ligaments, bone ends are not displaced. Tenderness, swelling, ecchymosis, inability to use. There's a big difference. No deformity. And again, it can look like a sprain. It can be fractured. And that's why the signs and symptoms sure do look the same. It's fracture, dislocation, sprain. Okay. Spr sprains. The degree of joint dislocation at the time of injury cannot be determined during the exam. But extensive damage to the neurovascular structures may have occurred. That's what the docs are hunting. Okay. We can't do anything about this. I can check for this on a little PMS, okay? Um, everybody good with PMS, right? Pulse, motor, sensation, right? Uh, be good at finding pedal pulses. You'll check them pretty, actually, pretty often on these little. It'll be, I fell and I fractured my hip. I decide if it's right or left side fracture, and I go down and I check PMS on that leg. I'm gonna do it every time. Strains, muscle pull, uh, minor injury, pain on active motion, not present on passive motion, 
they don't necessarily do a whole bunch for this. We're going to do a little. Could be. What's that? Yeah. A little ice action on it. Okay. So, assessment. Perform initial primary assessment. What is that? A, B, C, disabilities, C spine, if indicated. Fix all the A, B, C stuff. Find this on your head to toe. Okay. Locate the life threats. Fix them if you can. Assess for injuries of the head, chest, abdomen, pelvis. And assist distal neurovascular function. Assess PMS. Uh, with the exception of the pelvis and possibly femur fractures, ortho injuries are not, usually not, life-threatening. Okay, we hammer on this, pelvic and femur, especially in the older populations. Here you go. Remember we talked about distracting injuries from ABCs? Don't let it... You know, you're going to see some neat stuff. To me, it's neat. You might think it's sick and you puke when you get out of the truck. I don't know. When you see something awesome, remember ABCs first. Fix all that stuff first. It's the unobvious thing that kills the patient. <clears throat> Evaluation always must be done. Distal neurovascular function. Checking for pulse, skin color, cap refill, sensation movement. PMS. There you go. That's a uh, air splint. So when we splint anything, our goals are to prevent further movement, limit in, uh, tissue damage, nerve damage, vessel damage, and ease pain. We're easing pain and we're protecting. When in doubt, splint. It's difficult to different fractures, dislocations, and sprains because as you've seen, signs and symptoms are relatively the same. Principles of splinting. Again, you'll hammer on this when you get into the, the skill session on here. Do not move patients before splinting unless they're in danger. Okay? If their car's on fire and their lower leg is broken, do you wait and splint their leg or do you get them out of the car? Okay. See? It's all common sense. Not always, but it's all common sense. Remove clothes to allow inspection of the limb. Nope. Record PMS. They use this big fancy medical stuff before and after. So all of the skills that you guys are going to do when you put stuff on people, the KED, the traction splint, splints when you backboard. Before you backboard people, you check PMS. It's a national skill. You will be tested on it. If you don't do it, you will fail. You can do everything else perfect and forget to check PMS before and after and they will fail you quick, okay? That's why you keep seeing this distal neurovascular function. Check PMS before and after you put anything, anything on a patient. Good? All right. Uh, cover wounds with dry sterile compression dressings, fracture. Splint the joint above and below the fracture. Dislocations, splint the bone above and below the joint. <coughs> Did I say the bone below? Above. The bone above and the bone below the joint. Minimize movement, support injury to a complete pad splint to avoid local pressure. All right, we put extra towels, pillows, their jackets, whatever. Angulated fractures, realign before splinting. If you have resistance, stop and immobilize it as it is. A big one will be a knee injury. Okay, if you get a real for real knee injury, you're not gonna straighten their leg out. They're not gonna let you. I promise you, if you try it, you're gonna pay for it. It won't be anything personal, you're just, they're gonna guard. Okay. Yeah, it'll be a donkey kicking or something. Helmet across the head. Um, dislocation, split unless circulation is compromised, you can if you have circulation compromise, so I see something wrong with her leg, I check PMS and I can't find it. I go, hey man, come check. Do you feel a pulse down here and you say no? We can attempt to realign once. 
Okay, you're going to hurt them. You need to tell them what you're doing. It's going to hurt. You need to tell them this is going to hurt, but I have to do it to get your pulse back, to try and save your foot. Um, again, you have resistance or too much pain. Stop and be gone. This is a rapid transport. Okay, they're at they're at loss for. In reality, it's not rapid transport like wreck every car out on the way, like some action movie stuff. They have four hours, four to six hours, really, in the real world, before you lose. They have enough oxygen where they lose. Uh, there's death in the cells, okay? Any questions? The next one's uh, much longer, and it's more in depth. It's all neurology, head trauma stuff. So, go get you some drinks. Now is a great time to take a five-hour or whatever you call that thing, <laughs> right before bed. Skills will be done here. Okay. Skill sets are done here at the EMT level. The test is done, it's a computer based test, so you'll go to a test site. What, what's the next test we got? I can't click out of my. Your next test here? How long is our break? Um, take 10 minutes if you need it. Yeah, next time. Trauma emergencies, March 7th. Is that like the, the assessment? It's not paperwork. Yeah, there will be a paper test, and then afterwards you'll come in and do, you'll go to actual patient assessment on the trauma patient. It'll be like one-on-one. -on -one. It'll be you and me in a room, and you'll be doing a trauma assessment. Okay. You said you was, um... You're a paramedic too, right? And were you in um, Scott and White? I worked in Scott and White. Scott and White. I was on the books for about you a know, year and um, a half. Ray and Darren. Uh -huh. That's my brother. Oh yeah. You yeah. know Ray. He's a firefighter now too. Yeah, I still see him every now and then. He works part time yeah. up there. Yeah. We have a problem. Station one, is that where you're at? Yes. You're not on with uh, Shane Palmatol, are you? No, Shane's on like right now. He's on B shift, so I'll relieve him in the morning. In the morning. I was going in with him. Oh, yeah? Okay. Where is uh, Moeller at, Eric? He's downtown with me. Is he? On my shift. 
I grew up with him too.